we want to get into um, talking about the actual calculations that we get uh, from quantum mechanics as far as the energy of the electrons in specific orbitals. If we look at the hydrogen atom, what we see is that it would only have one electron. That electron would generally be located in a 1s orbital, as we described in the previous videos. Um, we could add a certain amount of energy to that hydrogen atom by adding heat or, or a particular light photon to it, and that might be enough energy to raise the energy of that electron one energy level and elevate it this high. So the atom would absorb that radiation or that energy and that electron would behave in this fashion for a while and then when it decayed back down, when it gave that energy off and the electron moved back down to the lower energy state, it would give that energy off, usually as light. Now when there are more than one electron around an atom, uh, when we look at helium atoms or other larger atoms, what we see is a difference in energy between S sublevels and P sublevels, and a difference in energy yet between P sublevels and D sublevels. And this makes it a little bit more complicated, figuring out where all the electrons would line up in a particular atom. Uh, for example, if an atom had enough electrons to fill up level 3, something that we'll notice here is that the 3D energy is a little bit higher than the 4S. The 4S fills up before the 3D, and so that'll make us a little bit more complicated when we start talking about larger atoms, and we'll develop a couple of different procedures for handling this later on. The reason this happens I refer to as shielding the shape of the s orbitals is more spherical, in fact it is a sphere, than any of the other orbitals. That is the most efficient shape as far as keeping its volume close to the nucleus. The dumbbell shape of the p orbitals is more spread out. That means there's more of a chance of some s orbitals electron getting in the way of a p orbital feeling the attraction of the nucleus. And so it's a little bit more difficult or a little bit higher energy level to put an electron in a P sublevel when the S's are full, and so on for D's and F's. The other thing to remember is that we're using algebra and calculus and, and uh, to describe each of these electrons as a wave. And uh, you might notice if we look at a sine wave, there are places where the sine wave goes through zero. Um, we call those nodes on the sine wave. If we're going to describe the electron as a sine wave, there are going to be places where the electron's wave function goes through zero. Uh, so for example, if we look at the 2s electron, we could think of the red section as the part of the sine wave that's above the x-axis, the white as being a node, a place where it crosses the x-axis, and the blue being a place where we're below the x-axis. Now remember, the probability of finding an electron in a particular spot is the square of the wave function. So that means that the 2s electron can be here in the red zone, or it can be here in the blue zone, but it can't be in this white area, this white uh, sphere, because the wave function is zero there, so the square of the wave function is zero there. Now that's hard to make sense out of uh, from our perspective because if it can be here and it can be here but not here, how could it get from the red area to the blue area without passing through the white? What we know is that we never see it in the white area. We only see it in the red and the blue. All we can do is observe it at different points and it's never in the places um, that the that quantum mechanics predicts that it will not be but it is sometimes on one spot and sometimes on the other. Another kind of node that shows up in the algebra and in the calculus of quantum mechanics when we look at the dumbbell shape of the p orbitals, the reason that dumbbell shape exists is because the wave function that describes p or orbitals has a built-in node in a particular plane a place where the wave function is zero and therefore the square of the wave function is zero. So again, the electron can be over here for this particular px electron, it can be over here 
And again, these represent two different signs of a wave, uh, two different, yeah, signs, plus or minus, of a sine wave function. But it is never in a nucleus. The nodes for d electrons are a bit more complicated. They would have two planes in their nodes, um, or uh, the dz squared electron has two cone-shaped nodes, and so that makes kind of a donut around the middle where the electron can be, and two lobes that are a little bit more stretched out than we would see from uh, p orbitals. Uh, but the electron cannot be in the cone that separates the donut from the lobes. Here we realize that f orbitals are even more complicated, or f sublevels, because they're going to have more planar nodes than the d sublevels. Each time we move up in uh, energy level, we add another node, and each time we move up in uh, in L sublevel, um, whether we go from S to P to D, we add another planar or conical node. All of this gets us to a theoretical explanation for the uh, rydberg palmer equation that we described earlier. Um, all of those, for example, in the hydrogen case, all of those visible spectrum lines that we had in the line spectrum for hydrogen, they were transitions from some higher level energy down to energy level two. Now what we couldn't see in that spectrum was uh, transitions from excited electrons that were in energy level two or higher down to energy level one. That's not because they weren't happening, but it's because this energy amount is large enough that the wavelength or the frequency of the light that's emitted is beyond what we can see. It's ultraviolet. And so the hydrogen atom spectrum includes ultraviolet radiation that we can't see with our eyes, as well as the four visible peaks we could see from the Balmer series. And additionally, some peaks that would show up if we could detect infrared radiation, and those are from higher level down to level three. So far we've talked in detail about three quantum numbers, the energy level, and that tells us uh, we're on level one, level two, level three, level four, and so on. The uh, sublevel um, that we denoted as quantum number L, and that tells us the orbital type, S, P, D, or F. Um, and uh, M sub L, which told us which direction that orbital type happened to be set up. We had a PX, a PY, and a PZ, and so on. Um, what we haven't talked about is the fact that there can be two electrons in each energy level, and that seems counterintuitive to us because electrons repel one another. Um, but the reason that is the case is because the, the uh, quantum mechanics mathematics works out an additional quantum number that we call the spin quantum number. We give it letter M sub S, and that is either positive or negative. The math works out that it's positive or negative one-half. Um, and the idea there is that when a charged particle, like an electron, spins in space, rotates in space, that generates a magnetic field. So two electrons that have the same charge but spin in opposite directions, plus one half and minus one half, would have opposite magnetism. Now their like charge is repelling, but their opposite magnetism is attracting. And that's not enough that we can put them both in exactly the same place at the same time, but it is enough to overcome the repulsion of the electrons enough that two can go in the same orbital at the same time. No more than two can go in the same orbital because once you have two electrons that are spinning in opposite directions, there's no third opposite direction to spin them. So we have what we call spin up and spin down or spin positive, spin negative, spin one half, spin minus one half. And so the rule that I just stated, the fact that no two electrons, I'm sorry, no more than two electrons can be in the same orbital at the same time 
is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Another way of stating that is that no two electrons on a particular atom can have the same four quantum numbers. If their level is the same, n, if their sublevel is the same, l, and that could be s, p, d, or f, a number that, uh, that works with those, um, and their direction of their orbital is the same, m sub l, then their spin quantum number has to be different, and there are only two choices for the spin quantum number. So from all of this, and this is what we're going to practice quite a bit in class, we can start to predict what electrons are going to be in what sublevels and what orbitals on each atom on the periodic table. We'll have a setup to be able to do this and we'll work these examples out in class and on homework and so on. The idea being that just like if you lived in an apartment building that had a lot of floors and a very unreliable elevator, you would want to live on the lowest floor possible. Um, electrons will gather in the lowest energy orbitals possible. And so let's say an atom has 33 electrons. We want to find the 33 lowest energy sets of quantum numbers to place those electrons in. And that idea is called the Aufbau principle. Hun's rule says if we get to a place, let's say a, a P sublevel, Let's say we're talking about nitrogen. Nitrogen atom has uh, seven electrons. Two of them can go in the 1s. Two of them can go in the 2s. That leaves three left to go in the 2p. But there, we mentioned earlier, a 2p sublevel has three orbitals. Those electrons are not going to be paired up in those three orbitals because it's a little bit higher energy to pair electrons up um, than it is to leave them unpaired if the orbitals are all the same energy. And that's Hun's rule that's stated here specifically. And so like I said, we're going to spend a fair amount of our time in class uh, over the next few class periods uh, going over this, working examples, and talking about why it's important, what we can predict about the behavior of atoms and molecules based on these ideas. I want to end this video with this slide, and I'm going to start the next one uh, with this slide and remind us what we were talking about. This is a periodic table, um, and the last term of the electron configuration for each atom is listed. Now look at how this goes. If we think of helium as being over here, then we have 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2. Notice this block that sticks up is two elements wide, and every atom in this block, every element in this block, has a configuration that ends in S. The ones in the first row ends in 1S, then 2S, then 3S, and so on. This block is six elements wide, and every configuration here ends in P. The first column, they all end in P1. 2P1, 3P1, 4P1, and so on. Second column, they all end in P2. 2P2, 3P2 and so on, out to P6, 2P6, 3P6, and so on. So we call this the P block because they all end in P, and this uh, and that makes sense because we said that P sublevels have three orbitals. They can hold six electrons since each orbital can hold two electrons. The ten, the ten, What we call the transition metals, this 10 element wide block that hangs down here, remember D's are five orbitals. That means they can hold ten electrons. Every element in this block has an electron configuration that ends in D. Every element in this 14, what we call the inner transition metals, um, has a configuration that um, ends in F. Um, there are a few exceptions in a couple of different places. We'll talk about the exceptions later on and why those exceptions exist. We'll talk about later on. Um, but the general rule is what I have just described. And like I said, we'll pick up here on the next video.